and now we will be moving to our next session uh, for the day uh, that is uh, that is career development in monitoring and evaluation uh, so before we move into that session i just want all the participants to use their uh, zoom reaction windows and give me a thumbs up if they are all here so it will be a good confirmation for all that they are here and we can start our session or maybe you can type in yes any reaction in the chat box that is good great great uh great great i think i think there are participants who came back from the break um great. we also have our uh, resource person for the session with us today uh, for we are very pleased to inform you that for in the session on the career development we have with us amanda um uh, and i'm glad to introduce amanda to you as one of my fellow colleague uh, who attended the first winter school as a participant and now she's uh, she's uh, joining us as a resource person uh, today she, amanda is co-leader at evaluate australia and new zealand and also a uh, independent consultant in monitoring and evaluation so very glad to welcome you amanda and really looking forward for this session i think i will stop my screen share now and uh, let you share your screen will that be okay great thank you so much umesh um and yes nice to join some previous participants here we're taking over <laughs> right, i also me... hope uh, also hope uh, almost of uh, from this Winter school also participant eventually will join the ecosystem of MNE professionals and take this forward to the new batch of YEs. Yes, of course. Having um, broader opportunities, it's always great. Um, okay, so I'm. Oh, I think I might not have shared that correctly. Let me just uh, start that again. Sorry. Okay, here we go. Um, so hello everybody. Uh, as Umesh mentioned, my name is Amanda. I'm a young and emerging evaluator from Australia. I have been a previous participant um, in the Winter School, previous resource person and the organising committee. Um, so it is definitely something that opens lots of doors. So to build on what Umesh said, uh, it's a great opportunity to get involved in other activities in the, um, the evaluation ecosystem as well. So in terms of what we're going to be discussing today, um, I've put together some materials for um, career development in evaluation. Uh, this is the first of two sessions that you'll have with me. So we ha also have the first session tomorrow, which will be a bit more forward looking and looking to implement what we learned today and how that can be um, put into your own M&E plan for tomorrow. Um, so the materials that I'm going to be presenting today and tomorrow uh, we're developed as part of a consultancy uh, with support from Eval Youth, the Global Evaluation Initiative, the P2P Career Plus um, hubs, and UNFPA, of course. So that's by way of introduction about what we are going to uh, be discussing today. Um, I will note as well that there is a workbook that will have been circulated to you uh, via email this morning. We will be working our way through some of the exercises that are in that workbook. So if you can download that from the Google Drive, that will really help you to uh, really get to practice some of what we're learning today. I will also post the, the link for the workbook in the chat. Yeah, yeah. I, I did not know whether it is intentional or not, so I thought I'll check with you. <laughs> no, not intentional. Thank you. Good to know. Uh, it seems to do it when I have my controls. So let me see if I can do that again. Great, thank you. Uh, okay, so I have shared the link for the workbook in the chat. Um, please note that you can't edit this online, so you will need to download a Microsoft Word version to complete. Okay, so in terms of what we're going to be covering today and tomorrow, we're going to look at some of the really key questions about career development in evaluation. So we're going to be looking at why you may be pursuing a career in evaluation, what it really is that motivates you about evaluation, 
We're then going to be looking at what the career of, um, evaluation landscape looks like, um, where there are career options, uh, where you fit within the broader landscape, those kinds of questions. We're then going to discuss a little bit about what some of the skills are that you need to be a successful evaluator, look at ways that you can gain these skills. And then as I mentioned tomorrow, we're going to be covering more of a forward looking plan. Now I know that I am running a few minutes behind already. Um, so I may run through some things quite quickly today, but if anything isn't clear when we come to the start of tomorrow, I'll give you an opportunity to uh, express that. So apologies in advance that we may have to fly through some of this, uh, but there will be a chance tomorrow to catch up if we need to. Okay, so moving straight into the content then. So this first module is looking at, about why you might want to pursue a career in evaluation. So what we're going to do with this module is we're going to hear from some more experienced evaluators about what it is about evaluation that draws them to the field. So while you're listening to these videos, think about if there's particular parts of the experts stories that resonate with you. Um, if you share some of the same passions, motivations or interests in relation to evaluation, or if there's something completely different that draws you to evaluation. And we're going to have a quick exercise around this um, afterwards. Okay, so first we're going to hear from Deborah Rugg. So Deborah is the Founder, Executive Director and Professor at the Claremont Evaluation Centre. Um, can somebody let me know if the video doesn't, uh, the audio doesn't work? Thank you. Becoming a professional evaluator maybe is a lifelong process that you evolve into over time. The need to uh, next assess your own motivation for doing evaluation is really, really important. Are you motivated to do evaluation, to, to find, um, to apply methodologies and, and do uh, the latest um, evaluation uh, studies to give to just advance the field or to help uh, inform a uh, agency? Are you really keen on account of the public accountability and holding people to account? Um, or do you want people to really uh, learn lessons and improve programs? Um, or do you want to change the system or all of it? And Okay, so you can hear there from Deborah that there's a range of different reasons that people may want to become an evaluator. So let's hear from a couple more experts. So next we have our very own Acela. So Acela is the president of the Asia Pacific Evaluation Association. He's also a national evaluation capacity development specialist with UNFPA uh, and is a big champion for years in the region. So over to Acela. I became a many officer when I was young, uh, like 25 years ago, but accidentally. I was the program person. I was, you know, involved in programming. And then uh, the m and officer uh, left the organization and I was promoted as the m and officer. That's how I became m and officer. But I was, I, I, I liked very much the m and uh, officer position where I learned about evaluation very much, but there were no uh, many opportunities to learn at that time. I know that now uh, young evaluators and people who are entering the profession have a lot of opportunities, training, academic courses, but at that time, uh, rare opportunities, I must say. And we had to learn uh, by doing it as well as, you know, through other uh, colleagues and uh, 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 friends. And uh, I think as Marco said, as evaluators, definitely we can contribute to success uh, or improvement of programming and uh, make difference in uh, people's lives. That is the best thing I have you know, ever learned in my career life as an evaluator, that as evaluators, we are contributing to better lives of people by bringing evidence and you know, uh, uh, advocating to use evidence. That is one thing. Uh, and at the same time, uh, I think uh, uh, when I got some opportunities to learn about evaluation through different uh, courses, IPTEC, of course, and some other training courses, I was able to expand horizons of uh, evaluation, uh, my evaluation profession. Okay, so uh, a couple of different takes there from what we heard from Deborah, but really about uh, focusing on being able to improve people's lives um, as the main focus, but also about expanding horizons having the opportunity to expand the reach of evaluations, those kinds of benefits. So the final video that we're going to, to listen to is Larry Bremner. So 
So Larry is the founder of Aval Indigenous, which is part of the Global Aval Partners Network. Evaluation has provided me with the opportunity to uh, work with unbelievably wonderful, dedicated people around the world who are really working hard to uh, to improve the lives of of youth, of adult learners, of communities, and so. For me, uh, the reason you become an evaluator is to, you can't change the whole world, but I always say if you can help change a little bit of the world to make it better for the people who live in that particular piece of the world, then that's all the reason you have for living and for being an evaluator. Okay, so two key parts there from, um, from Larry Bremner around the kinds of people that you get to work with being an evaluator and also again about uh, changing the world for at least some some people. So you can hear from uh, from these videos that there's really a range of reasons that you may want to pursue a, a career, whether that be really focused on the technical side, that there's a particular approach you're interested in, or more from a programmatic change, making differences for people's lives. Uh, it may even be increasing resource efficiency. There's a, a whole range of things. So what I'd like to do now is to understand a little bit about um, why you are all wanting to pursue a career in evaluation. Uh, now, I must confess, this is the first time I've used Mentimeter, and I think this slide isn't going to work. So just give me a moment and I will share the correct link. Okay, hopefully that link in the chat will take you to this Mentimeter poll. Um, if not, you can just go to menti.com and enter the code that's at the top of the screen here. Um, and then I'd really love you to enter a couple of words or a small phrase around what it is that really draws you to evaluation and why you want to pursue a career in evaluation. Curiosity, evidence-based decisions. Great to see some answers coming up here. Great. So really a uh, strong emphasis on, on doing good, making good changes, making sure that those changes are based on evidence, assisting in policy making. Okay. Um, being a professor in evaluation, so having that opportunity to teach other people, uh, measuring scale of impact. That's great. Thank you so much for, for participating in this. So we can see even within your responses that there's quite a range. There's some similarities, but there is also quite a range of uh, reasons that you may want to pursue a career in evaluation. focusing on what it means for implementation, a lot about curiosity and wanting to understand why and how things happen. Okay, great. Um, thank you for that. That really helps me to, to frame the rest of the session around what it is that draws people to evaluation and making sure that it's, it's relevant for you all. So thank you for participating in that. Um, okay, now let me just get back to my presentation. I think I did that wrong so that I've got the black boxes that can let me fix that. Okay, um, I did have a spot here for questions, but given we haven't covered a lot and we're a bit pushed for time, I might keep moving through. So if you can save your questions maybe until the end of the session, uh, I think that will be the way to go. Okay, so module two looks a little bit more at what the career landscape is like, what careers are available in evaluation, those kinds of aspects. So first, what I'd like to do is just introduce the, this idea of the career landscape. So if you think of the evaluation sector as a whole, as with most sectors, there's two main parts to it. There's the supply side and the demand side. So on the supply side, we have uh, evaluators. So these are the people with the, the skills, the knowledge and the experience to really be able to conduct evaluations. 
So this may be ind uh, individual evaluators, such as employees or consultants, but it could also be collectives of evaluators. So volunteer evaluators, volunteer networks, consultancy firms. So anybody that supplies evaluation experience is kind of framed on this side. On the demand side is people who have initiatives that need to be evaluated. So this is your commissioners. So this could be the public sector, could be private sector, could be international development sector. So this is really anybody that has anything that needs to be evaluated. You'll notice that there's this crossover in the middle. And so this is because, especially at the organisational level, some uh, organisations can act as both. So you'll see the example there is the government. So the government may have a, um, a project that needs to be evaluated, but they may also have an independent, uh, an internal evaluation team. So they kind of sit in the middle in that context. We've got this kind of third subset in the landscape as well, which is the evaluation capacity building and knowledge generation roles. So this is roles within universities or research institutions. Uh, so the person in the Mentimeter that said that they're a professor in evaluation, they would uh, fit into this category. And the final set, uh, section that we've got is these peripheral roles. So this is less focused on organisations and more thinking about individual roles. But there may be some roles that employ evaluation skills, but aren't necessarily strictly evaluation roles. So this may be a grant manager who has to evaluate uh, the different grant applications that come through along. Uh, so it's not technically an evaluation role, but they do use a lot of evaluation skills. So that's uh, very briefly the career landscape and kind of how you can conceptualize it to see where you fit in relation to the broader context. What I'd like to do now is move on to one of the exercises in the workbook. Uh, so I hope that you have all been able to access the workbook. If not, the link is in the chat. And so what I'd like you to do is there's a blank version of that diagram on the previous slide in your workbook. And so I'd like you to think about where you fit in your current role, where that sits in the landscape, and perhaps think about your two or three previous roles and think about where they fit. And then use a dotted line to think about where you want to move next. Uh, so I will give you probably about 10 minutes to, um, to work on this, but if I can get you to pop into the chat when you have finished th this exercise, it really helps me to just not keep you waiting if you uh, finish much sooner than the 10 minutes. Yeah, Amanda, it will be great if you can, uh, I mean, take a example and showcase also. M many of the participants may also not be uh, relating to it. So it will be great if you can take an example about anyone you know that, Okay, in this hypothetical situation, this is the transition. So it will help them. Sure, no problems. Uh, let me just go back to here then. Um, so perhaps I, I um, as an emerging evaluator, obviously have a very short career path at the moment, um, but I can kind of map where, where I have come from. So I've been working in evaluation for about four years, but I am still in my first evaluation related role. So I would say that I started kind of out here in an external field. Uh, and then I came probably in through the capacity building in that I was a university student. Um, I studied a little bit of evaluation. And then I now sit in the evaluator supply side. So I work for a consulting company as a independent consultant. So I would now say that I fit in this supply side here. And then in terms of where I want to go, I really enjoy practicing evaluation. So I would say that I probably want to stay somewhere in this supply side. So that's kind of the progression that you can see um, in your workbook. You'll see that there's a box for external field. So you may have started somewhere else and then have moved into evaluation. So I, I hope that is clear now. Uh, if not, please do put any questions in the chat or feel, feel free to unmute and ask away. So we just had a, a comment in the, the chat about whether you actually have to draw the lines on the map. Uh, if it's too hard to edit the diagram or to, to draw, then it is fine to just kind of map the transition in your head. It's really just to 
get you to think about where you currently are and what other opportunities are available to you. And again, if you are trying to access the workbook, you cannot edit it online, so you need to download a copy. Yeah, and just adding a question, comment that when Amanda means peripheral roles, which use many, it may refer to various roles that you will be doing either in various sectors, health, education, policy, governance, and even where is your job is not uh, full time related to MNE, but you you are connected with MNE in some small works. And eventually, if you want to join either evaluation networks as a volunteer or as a professional. So this is the supply side is what she meant. Yes, thank you for that clarification. And I should mention as well, just in case anybody is not familiar, this acronym down here, VOPES. This is your voluntary organization for professional evaluation. And they are a wealth of knowledge and a wealth of resources about evaluation. And also a really key part for networking. Uh, so if you're not familiar with um, what which VOPE it is in your country, um, I think in your workbook, you have a link to the IOCE list of VOPEs. And so through that list, you can reach out to your VOPE and find out how you can connect with them. Okay, now in the interest of, of time, we may have to move on. But as I said, if you didn't get to finish the exercise, that's no problem. You can go back uh, to it after the session. Okay, we were going to do a couple of polls here, but I am aware that I'm running behind schedule. So I might skip those, um, sorry, production team for making you put those together and then not using them. Um, but I might skip straight through some of the content. Okay, so we've talked generally about how the career landscape looks, uh, what's included, where things fit. But it's also important to note that there are some shifts that are happening that apply across the landscape. So they are not specific to any um, one kind of area that we had mapped. Okay, so you will probably be aware that um, evaluation is always changing, pivoting, adapting. There's always new knowledge being developed. Um, and so it's really important to, to keep across that as best to as best you can, um, but I wanted to highlight here some of the key shifts that may impact how uh, you do evaluation. The one thing here is that there is an increasing demand for um, evaluators to have the ability to evaluate complexity and context aware evaluation. So there's increase, increasing recognition that evaluations don't happen in isolation and neither do the programs that we're evaluating. So it's really important to be able to recognise how the broader context has influenced that and also how the complexity um, of relationships that uh, an evaluation and initiative are involved in can also impact on the evaluation. There's also been a shift to increased emphasis on participatory methods. Um, so this is perhaps not quite such a recent shift. Um, it has been something that has been um, getting increasing recognition for a long time now, but it's also important to note the importance in terms of building those skills. There's also a focus on cross-cutting issues like human rights, gender mainstreaming and sustainability. And so by this, I mean that there is an increased emphasis on all evaluators being able to evaluate these, these um, issues to some extent. Um, so you don't have to be a specialist in them necessarily, but to be able to integrate those considerations into your evaluation practice is really important. Uh, there's a focus to engage national staff. So this change has particularly sped up during the COVID-19 pandemic where people could not travel. And so there was a focus on engaging people in country. But it has been a shift that has been happening for, for longer than that as well, and a focus on building national evaluation capacity. There's also increased focus on the potential of evaluation for transformation, which is somewhat linked to this last dot point about the role that evaluators can play as advocates. So there's increasing um, understanding about the potential and the use of evaluation, um, which is a bit of a shift from a, a purely accountability perspective that has uh, historically been. 
And so, you know, it was previously great. We've ticked the box, we've done the evaluation, put it on the shelf, that's great. Uh, but now there's increasing recognition that using that evaluation to inform decisions, to make programmatic changes, like some of you mentioned in the Mentimeter, can really increase the potential for a transformation. And so evaluators as providing that material can play an important role as an advocate. Okay, so now I want to talk about some of the key career pathways that you may come across. And so I'm going to tackle a couple of key questions that come up. Um, but firstly, I want to put this big disclaimer across the top. There is no single career pathway for evaluation that is right or wrong. Everybody has a different story. If you ask 10 different evaluators how they became evaluators, you will get 10 very different answers. So uh, first and foremost to note that just because your pathway may look different to somebody else's doesn't mean that either of you are on the right or wrong pathway. So with that in mind, some of the key questions that uh, come across a lot with career development talk is whether you have to become a specialist in a particular area or whether it's best to maintain a broad set of knowledge. And again, neither is right or wrong, but there are different considerations for each of these. On the broad side, it may mean that you can do a greater variety of work. If you don't have a very specialised niche set of skills, you're eligible for a much broader range of work. Accordingly, there may be more opportunities available if you are qualified to conduct um, a broader range of work. And so then you may have some more flexibility. You can pick and choose a little bit from these opportunities of what you want to work on. However, on the specialised side, if there is a topic or context that you are really passionate about, then you can really drill down and become an expert in that. You can really tailor what you specialise in to your interests or to what you enjoy. And there's also quite a lot of flexibility in deciding what to specialise in. So it could be a thematic area, it could be a particular context, it could be a particular approach or method. So again, not one right or wrong answer, but just some different considerations and different, uh, I guess, selling points for each pathway. Another key question that uh, comes up is about whether it's best to be uh, an employee of an organization or whether you're best to be an independent consultant. Again, I know I sound like a broken record, but no right or wrong pathway. These are both valid options uh, and they just have slightly different benefits. But on the employee side, you may find that it's more stable. You may be able to sign a longer term contract. Um, so those kinds of aspects, you're also guaranteed work. Uh, so the consultant work can kind of ebb and flow quite a lot. And so on the, uh, on the employee side, you're more guaranteed to get work. And you also have regular hours, which uh, can be quite a nice selling point. On a consultant side, there may be more flexibility so you're not tied to um, what the organisation that you're working for, the kind of work that they do. You can be flexible in what you take on. Similarly, you have greater autonomy over work. So you really have, you really get to make the choices about what work you take on and what work you don't take on. Uh, and you may also have uh, more varied opportunities. So that's slightly related to that first start point about more flexibility. So if you're, for instance, if you were an employee at a, environmental firm, then you're more likely to be evaluating environmental projects. As a consultant, you may have the flexibility to say, oh, I've had some of environmental expertise, so I can do that, but I can also take on a gender program. So there's um, that, there's more variation there. Again, I was going to run through some of these um, polled, but I think I might skip over those um, and I'll come back to questions at the end of the session, like I already mentioned. Okay, so module three talks much more around the skills of professional evaluators, so the core competencies that we need to build as evaluators. So firstly, we're going to look at what competencies are, why we should care about them, what, how we use them, all of those kinds of questions. So you can see on the slide here that competencies are really a set of skills and attributes for successful ethical and professional evaluators. So these are much more around the skills that the person possesses. You may also hear reference to standards for evaluation. 
And so competencies are different in that standards refer to practices, ethics and behaviours for conducting evaluations. So they are much more around the evaluation process itself, whereas competencies are much more focused on the evaluator. So why are competencies important? Well, they're used for ensuring high quality of evaluations, and they can also provide important guidance and give us a bit of a roadmap to help our professional development as well. They're also forming the basis for quite a lot of professionalisation activities that are happening. Um, so I know that the Canadian Evaluation Society has a credentialisation program. Um, and so that's one of the professionalisation aspects uh, and they use the competencies to map that professionalisation. It's also important to note that there are several different competency frameworks. So I've got links to just a couple of them here. Um, I think they are also in your workbook. Um, so because there are so many different ones, what I've done for this presentation is I've drawn in kind of the categories of um, competencies. So we are gonna look much more at the domains rather than the specific skills that are in each competency. Um, this is because the detail and the specific skills vary a lot depending on which framework you're looking at. So that's an important thing to note. Um, so we are going to look at these six competency domains, but as I mentioned, each framework has really specific competencies. And so it's worth looking at a couple of them and really delving into that more detail. Um, oriented stuff. Uh, so I'm just going to run through briefly what each of these mean and then we're going to do a quick exercise to get you to think about how they apply in the real world. The first domain that we're going to talk about is evaluative attitude and reflective learning. So this is very much about embodying evaluation in your own thinking and being able to look internally and apply evaluation um, thinking to yourself as well. So this is really having an interest in critical thinking, being committed to evaluative thinking, not just when you're uh, conducting an evaluation, but more generally as well. It also talks about self-awareness and reflective learning and how this can inform your continuous improvement. So this is about being able to, to look critically at yourself and say, this is where I feel that I'm very strong. This is where I perhaps need to improve. So it's that, um, really being able to have those honest and frank conversations with yourself, I guess. Um, it's also got a slight external focus as well. So it's looking at promoting the potential of evaluation and advocating for evaluation use. So it's um, yeah, looking externally, trying to encourage use of evaluation. Um, and accordingly, it's also about building evaluation capacity in others. So there's kind of the two aspects to this one, be, being able to look internally, and also being able to promote externally. Okay, the second domain is about professional practice and sound management. So this is about being able to apply the appropriate tools and approaches. This is also where the standards that I mentioned come in. So it's about being able to adhere to these. Um, also to note that there are several different standards um, available as well. So if you are interested in delving into that a little more, uh, there's several different um, frameworks around that as well. And so it's also being able to commit to some of these kind of princ key principles of evaluation. So transparency, inclusiveness, using appropriate evidence. Uh, and so it's really being motivated by good evaluation practice. It also means that you're able to critically look at methodologies and approaches and identify limitations. And then the project management side comes in here as well. So it's about your skills to define, negotiate, scope, plan, and really just manage um, the evaluation process. It also includes leadership skills if you're in a leadership position within an evaluation. Okay, the third aspect that we're going to run through is evaluation theory and knowledge. But this is really looking much more at the theoretical aspects of evaluation. So being across particular models, approaches, methods, tools. And it's also really being able to systematically inquire uh, and really critically look at things. So it's literature review, 
being able to interrogate logic and coherence, uh, being able to understand data validity and reliability, and really just being systematic in your approaches. On the technical evaluation skills, this focuses much more on the practical skills that you need for evaluation. So this is one where as new approaches and new uh, knowledge around evaluation comes out, that this is something that really evolves um, and evolves a lot through your career as well, through gaining experience. So this is things like being able to assess program availability, being able to frame topics and questions, and being able to appropriately apply the evaluation criteria. So it's one thing to be able to say that you know the criteria, but then having the, um, the knowledge and the skills to be able to apply that to the certain contexts. Um, it's also about sampling methods, uh, stakeholder engagement, evaluation design. So you can see that this is much more about the practical nuts and bolts of doing evaluation. The next one is around contextual awareness. So I touched on this a little bit in the shifts in the um, evaluation sector as well, but it's really key to be able to understand that the interventions, whether that be the project or program that you're evaluating, they're not done in isolation. They are affected by the broader context and the complex interactions that um, happen. So then being able to understand that context and to be able to adopt culturally appropriate approaches being able to respond respectfully. So it's one thing to be able to identify that the context is having an impact, but then being able to actually respond in an appropriate manner is really important. Also about understanding and handling complexities in systems, being able to clarify a diverse perspective. Um, so you're gonna um, hear different perspectives from different people depending on their level of involvement or how they've been involved in a project or program. And so being able to clarify and understand how all of those fit together is really important. Uh, similarly, it's also important to be able to understand power and privilege and how those may impact on what you're hearing about the, the project or the program. And it's also important to note that the evaluation context changes over time. So this is a key part of contextual awareness as well, to be able to recognise that years and years of different contexts and experiences have gone into building to the program as it is today and understanding how that has impact on the results achieved. Okay, the next one is interpersonal skills. So this is obviously important for any uh, career, but it's particularly important for us in evaluation. This is about your communication skills and being able to use the appropriate skills for a whole range of stakeholders. It's also around collaboration, facilitation, negotiation, knowledge sharing skills, lots, all of those skills that we need to be able to interact with other people. It also involves really um, internalizing respect and making sure that we're embodying that in all of our evaluation processes. It's the ability to build and maintain relationships, whether this be with other evaluators or whether it be with um, beneficiaries from projects that you're evaluating, um, it's all aspects of relationships. It's also around being able to maintain an objective perspective. So this is strongly linked to the context aspect, but being able to recognise where the perspectives that you're hearing from other people, they are from their own perspective. And so you need to be objective to be able to fit all of those together and make a coherent uh, evaluation report out of that. Also important to note that this talks about different communication methods, so both written and verbal, and the ability to actively listen and build trust. So these two are really important. It's one thing to be somewhat listening. It's another to really be actively listening, being able to identify where you need to delve further and to be able to identify where there are aspects that perhaps don't fit with the rest of the narrative that you're hearing. Okay, so that was, I know, a, a very brief rundown of what the competencies are. So we may be able to extend this exercise slightly um, so that I can duck between um, breakout rooms and hear if there are any, any questions. But what we're going to do is in your workbook, there's a table 
that has several challenges listed. Um, and then it has one competency domain put against each challenge. And so in your groups, I'd really like you to think about, um, about why the competency domain that's listed, why that would be useful to overcome the challenge. And also if there are any others from the list that you may need to employ to overcome the challenge. Uh, so I am aware that this will be the first time we're going into breakout rooms for this session. So if you can spend a few minutes just introducing yourselves around the group, maybe um, your name, where you're from, what your current role is, uh, and that'll just help to uh, get everybody to know each other before we, we jump on into the exercise. Um, so I think we are ready to break out now. Um, as I said, if there's any questions, I will be ducking um, between the breakout rooms. So I'm uh, excited to hear what you, you all came up with. So we'll just do a, a quick run through some of the groups. Uh, so group one, um, I forgot to tell you to take note of which group you're in, but if anyone remembers there were group one, please feel free to unmute and summarize a little what you discussed. We are not sure about our group. I don't know we are which group we are. No problem, go for it. Uh, I don't know what group you were either, but feel free to discuss. <laughs> fine, fine, we tried our, uh, we initially tried to um, interact with each other, but the first thing is, I guess this, this was the time limitation. Uh, we, we might need more time to complete, but it's still okay. We uh, introduce each other firstly, and try to know each other and then understand the assignment. So the first is uh, the first challenge listed here is the scope effectiveness has been changed or increased after the evaluation has been started already. So we try to add more competencies. Uh, the, the two were already given. The first was the professional practice and sound management. Secondly, we, we thought that uh, there needs to be a uh, addition of uh, interpersonal skills. The reason means we need to communicate and uh, uh, with the with the it could be the donor, it could be the implementing team or other stakeholders, uh, and we need to collaborate. So, so these could be the second, uh, uh, third or second edition of the competency area. And secondly, we, we had decided another area uh, that's uh, attitude of the personal attitude of the evaluator. So, this means the level of honesty towards the duty and the commitment towards the task. Uh, this is what we have thought. And again, I'm sorry, we, we, we couldn't conclude due to the limitation of time. Uh, we we no, might, we could have good, uh, done well, but the time was a constraint. Thank you so much. That's already great. Thank you so much. Um, I know that we were a little short on time, so I appreciate you uh, bearing with me and getting through as much as you could. Um, you're definitely correct in all of these, that there was uh, interpersonal skills, communications obviously a key, and particularly when you're negotiating here. So that's why the sound management is in here. Um, so the person who is asking you to evaluate more activities may not necessarily be familiar with evaluation. And so that's where the evaluative attitude comes in. And it's an opportunity for you to really facilitate learning on their part and to really uh, identify why this is a problem uh, and why it is important to be clear on the scope before an evaluation is started. So you're, you're spot on there. Did anybody else discuss challenge one that wants to add anything to that discussion? Yes, uh, yes. hi, Amanda. This is Sada. Hello. Uh, I don't remember the group number, uh, but uh, Sada, Sada, it's SR and Nova and I think Ramona some of the participants with me, eight, mm -hmm. we were eight people. So we also discussed uh, challenge number one here. And yes, we also added interpersonal skills uh, as one of the competencies, but we added two more to it. Uh, so, uh, and yes, we added the reasons also for interpersonal skills. It is, we needed to have more discussion rounds uh, uh, to understand the process, to get more uh, information on uh, for what the evaluation uh, is being done for. Then we added two more competencies. One is contextual awareness uh, and skills in project management here. Uh, so for contextual awareness, uh, the reasons were because 
uh, the, the projects are dynamic in nature evaluation projects and there's uh, there's a lot of scope of changing uh, and awareness regarding the change in the scenario is important to actually evaluate a project and then for the reasoning for the skills in project management uh, are to better implement the program uh, better budget utilization uh, and allocation of uh, appropriate work to the staff uh, to in order to take better decisions as a result of the evaluation <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much. Um, you. Again, you're, you're spot on with all of that. And you can really see just from this one example, how you often need to employ a, a variety of and a combination of competencies to one situation. And so like I mentioned, you are probably already doing these things, but you don't necessarily know that they uh, tick the boxes of the competencies. So thank you very much for that feedback. Uh, just quickly, did any groups talk about challenge two that would like to share? Um, yeah, uh, if I may go ahead, uh, Amanda, uh, yeah. we were talking with, I think we, there were Shiny and Shreya and there were a few other people who were there. Uh, we discussed this particular problem by saying that if we do not have experience, we should not just uh, like, you know, limit ourselves or try to change the methodology, but in fact, seek training uh, or at the same time, if we can also rely on our own network of uh, say people who are also like, you know, volunteering in similar spaces or working in similar spaces who might have expertise. So to get their honest opinion on this particular pr approach. Uh, second, and we also talked about reading up on contemporary literature, which is surrounding that particular idea. Um, and yeah, I, oh, that that's great. Shiny actually wrote in the chat and that is also uh, seeking out training. She asked for any specific skill and uh, one of the suggestions also given by one of our group members was to have a snowball approach or a focus group discussion to understand the pros and cons of this particular new method. Yes, that's great. Thank you. So um, really looking to, to build those skills. So I'm really employing that evaluation theory and knowledge. And so you've also mentioned uh, the interpersonal skills in terms of drawing on your, your, um, your own network. Uh, and also a bit the evaluative thinking and attitude as well. Um, so to be able to recognize that this is perhaps a limitation in your own knowledge and then to be able to identify where you can go to get that knowledge. So that's really great, thank you. And just quickly, did any uh, groups talk about challenge three? Okay, I'm going to take that that was a no from talking about challenge three. Amanda, we also did this. Actually, we did for three challenges. And this was also one of the one we also did this. It's from the same group, group six. So we were feeling that this kind of situations we have faced. And uh, we were thinking that using the term flaw altogether would be a negative impact to the entire thing. So we thought of remodifying and modifying the methodology and understanding, uh, putting it together that how we, if this can be remodified. Also contacting the commissioner to understand what kind of perception he or she had for this, understanding their kind of rationale for this. Also triangulating some of the existing studies to understand what kind of flaws has come up. And uh, also like if we can uh, call to them, have a meeting with them, network with them. So yeah, this kind of things was coming out. Great, thank you. So uh, very much modifying the methodology and being able to recognise that there are flaws that comes under the technical evaluation skills. Contacting the commissioner is a really important aspect of interpersonal skills, being able to build that relationship and understanding. Uh, it may also call for the evaluative attitude again in terms of it's an opportunity for you to teach the commissioner about the approach that they have proposed and why you are proposing the changes there. Okay, great. I saw that there was a couple of comments in the chat as well. So I'll just have a quick look through those. Uh, so from group six, referring to challenge two um, was a lot of what we covered. Um, and uh, Emily, hello. Emily's one of my um, FL Youth Australia. Hello. 
people. <laughs> um, conscious of time, thank you. Um, so really talking about management skills to be able to manage scope, um, ability to adapt, uh, the evaluation plans. So that's a really important skill. Interpersonal skills to be able to propose recommendations and frame those, like you mentioned, uh, in a way that isn't negative to the relationship between the commissioner and the evaluator. So that's really great. I did see that there was a hand that went up to Pani, I think. Did you want to, to say something? Uh, actually, I just wanted to uh, tell the interpersonal skills for the third uh, challenge because it requires more when we negotiate with the commissioner especially. So uh, anyway, you have just put the... <sighs> Thank sure. you. And you, uh, you mentioned an important word there as well around negotiation, which also, also comes under the sound management skills as well. So, um, again, the, um, you have all grasped the message of the, the exercise is that often you need to employ, employ a combination of skills to overcome challenges and to respond to situations. Now, I know that I am a little over when I was meant to finish, but just quickly, is there any questions um, at all related to what we've covered today? Uh, I will check in again tomorrow. So uh, if anything does occur to you overnight, we can discuss them tomorrow. But uh, I just thought I'd check now if there's any questions. Feel free to either type them in the chat or to unmute. Okay, I think that's a no. Um, but like I say, we will re revisit it tomorrow. So if there are any questions that occur to you overnight, we can cover those first tomorrow morning. Um, so I'll just swap back to my presentation. Thank you so much, Amanda. But uh, do you want to uh, leave us with a parting message summarizing whatever we spoke today and what all we like, want to cover tomorrow also? Yes, of course. Um, so I have just put the, the slide up here that talks about uh, what we've covered today and where we're going tomorrow. So hopefully from today, we've answered the question about why you should pursue a career in evaluation. I hope that the videos that we watched sparked some other thoughts in you that you perhaps hadn't realised were part of your motivation for pursuing evaluation or you hadn't realised were a potential through evaluation. And so really being able to tailor your career to your passions and your motivations is really important and something that we'll touch on again tomorrow. We've also talked about what some of the career options are within the landscape and what skills you need to build to be a successful evaluator. So we've covered those today. Tomorrow we'll build on that to look more at how you can gain those skills and then how you can really um, combine everything that we've talked about so far in terms of your motivations and passions the options that are out there and the skills that you have and how you can use those to plan your career. So thank you very much for your participation today and I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Great, I think Amanda, that was a really good session and I uh, saw in a couple of breakout rooms, I think this is the first time participant also joined in various breakout rooms in a small, se uh, small setting where they can discuss, get to know each other and also um, share their inputs on a specific focused activity. Uh, for me, it was very uh, en uh, enriching experience. Also, the workbook is, I, I thought, was a very good input for all of the participants. So on behalf of the organizing committee, I want to thank you. And of course, since you are there tomorrow, <laughs> we'll thank you elaborately tomorrow. Uh, uh, I think we have a time for one questions i think we are still two minutes away so i would if we can accommodate one question is that fine with you amanda of course no problem yeah i didn't so, want to cut uh, your requesting, short. yeah yeah so requesting participants if anybody have we can we can take one quick question uh of yes yes, yes. uh so uh ask We'll request any participants to unmute themselves and ask one question, and then we will we'll summarize for today and again conclude this session. Do we have any questions?
Hi, yeah. Deepan here uh, from yeah. Sri Lanka. Uh, I was wondering whether we have to submit this uh, work, what we did uh, today, and uh, we are going to do tomorrow in the workbook. No, definitely not. I'm um, not marking you on any any scale at all. Uh, it's more just to help your understanding of the content we are covering. So do not worry about having to complete it overnight or anything. That is fine. Okay. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Mish. Great. So requesting every uh, Amanda uh, requesting everybody to kind of sh open their videos so that we can have a group picture with Amanda uh, um, and also. Uh, Meanwhile, I will share that there is a uh, Asia Pacific Evaluation Journal of Evaluation. Uh, as I shared yesterday also, uh, encourage all of you to write uh, and check out our website. And we periodically call for papers to submit your articles. We'll be very happy to a, reach out and read whatever articles are published in the journal. And also you can contribute. 